Income tax 2023-2024 reporting rental income expenses and losses overview. Get ready and some coffee because if you try telling the IRS auditor a joke about taxes, they won't depreciate it. Most of this information can be found in publication 527 residential rental property, including rental of vacation homes tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Rental income reported on the schedule E flowing into the income tax formula line one income. Remember in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement having income minus instead of expenses deductions resulting in instead of net income taxable income. The rental income reported on the schedule E similar to business income reported on a schedule C basically has an income statement format in and of itself in essence reporting rental income minus rental expenses which you can think of as rental deductions resulting in in essence net rental income which is what flows in from the schedule E to line one income of the formula this formula outlining the calculation on the form 1040 of which we see the first page the income section here schedule e ultimately rolling into line eight additional income from schedule one. First, a word from our sponsor yeah actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one additional income the schedule e rolling into line five rental real estate from the schedule e this is the schedule e supplemental income and losses having an income statement type of format. All right, so we're continuing on reporting rental income expenses and losses at this point. Remembering, of course, that's basically the format of the Schedule E having an income statement format, the income that we're generating from the rental and the expenses ordinary and necessary to the business of the rental property being in essence the deductions. Remembering also that if we run into a situation of losses, that's when we could be having problems in uh, limitations on the possible losses because the IRS is our silent partner and you will know that the silent partner as we have income is happy they just want a piece of it and they're they're good but if we have a loss then the silent partner does not want to pay us for the losses so they're going to possibly put restrictions on our ability to get benefits from the losses such as being able to take those losses against other income like W-2 income. So that's one of the things to be careful of. That's one of the things that possibly could differentiate a Schedule E reporting than an, another type of business that might be reported, say, on a Schedule C, which might have different kind of restrictions in the case of losses. Also noting rental income often likely to have a loss because people that have a second home might be holding on to that second home for multiple different reasons other than simply the rental income such as they want to have a hedge that's going to going to play against uh, if there's some problem with inflation or something like that. Now they have uh, the property that could help out that way. Also, the value of the property might be going up in terms of the capital gains of the property just simply because of the scarcity of the property. And then additionally to that, you have, of course, the rental component of the property. So therefore, they might be okay to be taking 
losses on the property, hoping that the property still goes up in value just because of the capital gains and locations of it and to keep the property you know, as a hedge. And therefore, again, we could often be dealing with this kind of losses situation and any kind of restrictions for them. Okay, figuring the net income or loss for a residential rental activity may involve more than just listing the income and deductions on the Schedule E Form 1040. There are activities that don't qualify to use the Schedule E, such as when the activity isn't engaged in to make a profit or when you provide substantial services uh, in conjunction with the property. Now, there's been kind of a tug of war with the Schedule E. Now, remember the differences on the Schedule E and the Schedule C. When we talked about a Schedule C, a business, we had questions about whether it is a legitimate business or a hobby. Uh, and that's going to be an important question because, again, a hobby is likely to have losses and the IRS is going to say, hey, no, that's a hobby. It's not a business. You have losses. We don't want to basically allow the losses. So that's one thing that we need to keep in mind. There's also been a tug of war with regards to passive income versus active income, noting that in a Schedule C business, when we have a service business, we actually have to do work to generate the revenue. We're not just holding on to property and generating the uh, passive income. So the IRS is typically going to be more skeptical or harsh on like passive income and allowing passive like losses. So they, they try to categorize all rental income as, in essence, passive income. But obviously, some rental activity, that's their business. Their business, they're actively involved in rental business, doing work in a similar way as if they were in another business reported on the Schedule C. So then they're claiming, hey, look, I should be able to take losses similar to what a Schedule C can do because I'm putting in labor and so on, similar to the Schedule C. So you have this back and forth that kind of worked out into this compromise where we have these terms such as, is it passive income? Do you actively participate? Are you a real estate professional, which will have implications on what you can do with losses, how much of the losses you might be able to take, and possibly even whether or not to report on a Schedule E versus a Schedule C. And if it doesn't qualify for rental activity, then you might still get a benefit from the real estate itself as, say, a second home, possibly being able to deduct the mortgage interest and real estate taxes still on an itemized deduction schedule A, but possibly not being able to deduct, you know, all the other stuff, depreciation being a big one on the schedule E. So these are some of the things we're getting into. So there are also the limitations that may need to be applied if you have a net loss on the schedule E. There are two. Number one, the limitation based on the amount of investment you have at risk in your rental activity. Now, that one usually isn't as big an, an, an issue for most people that have rental property because they're usually at risk, meaning uh, they're at risk for like if they took out a loan, then then the property is usually going to be collateral on the loan, for, ex for example. But you can imagine situations where they don't have an at risk uh, scenario and and the iris is going to limit the losses because you're not basically taking on risk in that case uh so but the other one too the special limits imposed on passive activities is something that many rental properties are going to have to deal with and that's when it gets into this is it passive or is it active are you a real estate professional are you not a real estate professional but it's not completely passive because you're actively participating and therefore possibly being able to take some of the losses, even though we're kind of classifying it as passive, in which case you usually don't get to take the losses unless you take them against other passive income. Okay, so you may also have a gain or loss related to your rental property from a casualty or theft. This is considered separately from the income and expense information you report on the Schedule E. So if you had a casualty or theft situation, then that, of course, hopefully is an unusual type of situation you'd have to think about possibly in isolation, right? So which forms to use? So the basic form for reporting residential rental income and expenses is the good old Schedule E Form 1040. So rather than the Schedule C, we're going to the Schedule E. What are the major differences between a business on the Schedule C and something reported on the Schedule E? One, you typically don't have the, the self-employment taxes on a Schedule E, which you do have on a Schedule C, in part, you can think of most likely because it's not 
completely an active activity. There is that passive component to it. So that is huge. And you don't have some of that, the qualified business expense deduction that you would have on a Schedule C versus the Schedule E. And uh, the Schedule E, however, could be subject to some of those loss limitations, which the Schedule C might not be as subject to, such as, for example, the passive activity rules. So however, uh, don't use the schedule to report a not-for-profit activity. So if it's, if it's a not-for-profit activity, then you, know, you have a different scenario. You could see it not rented for profit later in chapter four. There are also other rental situations in which forms other than the Schedule E would be used. Possibly if you're a real estate professional and it's your active business, you're, you're actively participating, not just as an, an active participant of the rental property, but it's your active business. Maybe you then report it on a Schedule C being subject to the self-employment tax and so on. Schedule E form 1040. So if you rent building rooms or apartments and provide basic services such as heat and light, trash collection, etc., you normally report your rental income and expenses on Schedule E part number one. List your total income, expenses, and depreciation for each rental property. Be sure to enter the number of fair rental and personal use days on line two. So from a logistical standpoint, how does this happen? You might have a bookkeeper or you might be doing the books, something like QuickBooks, usually more on a cash-based system, applying out the expenses, creating the income statements, possibly with the use of bank feeds and whatnot per property so that you can align them onto the Schedule E per property. And then you'll have the year-end adjusting entry, at least of depreciation, typically calculated by the software done by the tax preparer, possibly also having to deal with other issues such as the auto expenses, which is also a common issue similar to with a Schedule C situation. So if you have more than three rental or royalty properties, complete and attach as many Schedule E as are needed to separately list all the properties. So if you have five properties, there's only three listed on one Schedule E, you'll have to list more of them so that you have a separate income statement for each of the properties reported on the Schedule E, which is basically an income statement format. However, fill in lines 23A through 26 on only one Schedule E, because that's kind of combining in all the incomes on all the income statements for the Schedule E to help figure out the total incomes, which are passive or active or whatnot, and so on. So the figure on lines 23A through 26 on the Schedule E should be the combined totals of all properties reported on your Schedule E. So in other words, if you have like five properties, you have a separate kind of income statement on all the Schedule E's, which are in essence going to be summed together at the bottom of the Schedule E, because if they're all considered to be similar in nature in terms of you actively participating, you have the same kind of passive rules, hopefully, applied to all of them when we start to get into these loss limitations and so on and so forth. So on Schedule E, page 1, line 18, enter the depreciation you are claiming for each property. So clearly, we're going to list each property separately according to when we purchased it and the cost or basis and so on. You may also need to attach Form 4562 to claim the same, sum or all of your depreciation form. Uh, for, you can see that form in instructions if you want to look at that in more detail. If you have a loss from your rental real estate activities, you may also need to complete one or both of the following forms. You've got the Form 6198 at-risk limitations. That's usually in a situation where you're, you're, not, you're, you're not at risk because of a weird kind of situation on the loan or something like that. So where, where you're not like at risk of the loss so much. And so then so that's going to limit your losses. But then the other one that's possibly more common to basically a lot of rental activities is the form 8582 passive activity loss limitations. And you can see passive activity limits later. All right, the, the basic idea, by the way, with passive activities is they're going to say, hey, look, we're going we're, we're gonna to try to limit you to take the losses on passive activities against other income. But if you're limited to the losses, maybe you can roll it forward and take it in the future year if there's passive income to match it up against. So the general idea is we're going to keep passive income and losses in its own lane, only allowing the losses to be matched out against passive income 
income rather than netting those losses against other income such as W-2 or Schedule C type of income, active income. So page two of the Schedule E is used to report income or loss from the partnership, S corporation, estates, trust, and real estate mortgage investment conduits. We're basically focused on the real estate here. If you need to use page two of Schedule E and you have more than three rental or royalty properties, be sure to use page two of the same Schedule E uh, you used uh, to enter the combined totals for your rental activity on page one. Also, include the amount from line 26, part one, in the total income or loss on line 41, part five, form 4562. You must complete uh, and attach form 4562 if you are claiming the following depreciation in your rental activity. So rental activity by its nature typically means we own the property and the depreciation of the property itself is typically going to be a big component uh, part of our rental expenses. So we're going to have to generally f file possibly the form 4562 related to the depreciation at least of the property if not also in relation to other things that we're buying such as equipment furniture and so on depreciation including the special depreciation allowance on property placed in service during 2023 so you'll recall that 179 depreciation and special depreciation are going to be things often not applied to the property itself the real property but to other things that need to be depreciated like possibly furniture and equipment and uh, that kind of thing and then you're going to need this form 4562 depreciation on listed properties such as a car regardless of when it was placed in service so obviously tax software can help us to determine if we need those forms for depreciation and help us with the calculations Otherwise, figure your depreciation on your own worksheet. Now, in tax software, which you're almost certainly going to be using if you're calculating rental property and dealing with depreciation schedules, the software will typically generate the worksheet for you. Remember, if you're picking up a new client, you want to make sure that you get not only the tax return, but the depreciation schedules are going to be very necessary to make sure that you're starting out where they left off last time so you don't have to attach these computations to your return so that's kind of nice i guess but it's like it, that could lead you then to not be able to get those depreciation schedules uh when you pick up a new client or something so hopefully uh you have communication with the prior tax preparer and you can get a complete copy of the return including the schedules because those are important but you should keep them in your records for future reference you may also need to attach form 4562 if you are claiming a section 179 deduction amortizing costs that begin during 2023 or claiming any other deduction for a vehicle including the standard mileage rate or lease expenses you can see publication 946 for information on preparing form 4562 schedule c form 1040 profit or loss from business this is the form typically used for a sole proprietor type of business not typically for rental property but you can imagine situations where you're actively participating where possibly a schedule c would be the the form that needs to be used generally schedule c is used when you provide substantial services in conjunction with the property or the rental is part of a trade or business as a real estate dealer so you're a real estate dealer you're actively participating uh, and it's like a, an active service component to the business typically and remember if you have to go to the schedule c then there's pros and cons to that the, the bad side of that is that now you're going to be subject to social security and medicare which is highly big con but you could also be have benefits like a deduction uh, a big uh, business deduction possibly related to uh, this active income on the schedule c and you're paying into the social security system which might give you a benefit uh, if it's not been totally destroyed or fallen apart by the time you retire uh, but you also aren't going to have the same kind of limitations on the losses that you might have with the passive activity rules for the rental income providing substantial services so what does that even mean man 
If you provide substantial services that are primarily for your tenant's convenience, such as regular cleaning, changing linen, or maid service, you report your rental income and expenses on the Schedule C. So you're thinking more like a hotel kind of situation where it's not like I have a second home. I'm, not, I'm just, you, you rent it, you take care of it. I'm not going to get into your business or clean your laundry or, or you know, f make the bed every day or something like that. But if it's more like a hotel situation or part of your home is being rented possibly to multiple people and you're doing those types of services, providing meals and providing cleaning and, and laundry and that kind of stuff. Well, now you're completely clearly actively participating in more of a service based business, which happens to have a real estate component to it, rather than having more of a passive based uh, business that has more limited kind of physical activity related to it. Therefore, possibly it should be actively business income on the Schedule C rather than the Schedule E. So use form 1065 US return of partnership income if your rental activity is a partnership. So clearly, quite common to have multiple people two or three or four or more people owning the property. And, and then if that's the case, generally, you can have to report it in a partnership, right? Because you can't just report it on a Schedule E or else you would have to be breaking out each line item of income and expenses to each of the individual partners according to their partnership percentages in the place, which would be very complex, especially when you're dealing with like depreciation so that means you're usually gonna have to file a separate return, a partnership return, even if you didn't incorporate or create an LLC because you need the separate return to report the income on an income statement per property and then allocate it out to the individual partners according to the partnership agreement with the help and use of the flow through form, the K-1 form. So substantial uh, services don't include the furnishing of heat and light cleaning of public areas, uh, trash collection. So these kind of things is like, you're not actively changing the bed or you're cleaning their floor or anything like that. You're picking up the trash in the common area and that kind of stuff that doesn't make it into like a hotel kind of service business changing from a C schedule E to a C. For more information, see publication 334 tax guide for small business. If you're in the small business situation, we have another course or section on that if you want to check that out. Also, you may have to pay self-employment tax on your rental income using schedule SE. So if you have the schedule C, you got that self-employment tax. Oh no, that's not good. For a discussion on substantial services, see real uh, estate rents in chapter five of publication 334, qualified joint venture, the QJV. So if you and your spouse each materially participate, see material participation under passive activity limits later as the only members of a jointly owned and operated real estate business, uh, and you file a joint return for tax year, you can make a joint election to be treated as a QJV. Now, we have a separate course or section on the Schedule C where we have a similar kind of situation where remember that if you're two individuals and you get married, the idea there is that you're combining from two spirits into one and now you're like one entity and for taxes, you should be, you're taxed as one entity, which is basically the case for the federal income taxes, but we still have some issues in particular with regards to the way the social security and Medicare systems are set up, particularly social security, which is tied out to how much has been contributed, not based on entity, based on tax return, but rather based on individual social security number. So, so even though your federal income taxes might be the same, uh, they still, you still have this issue where we want to basically break out the income to be allocated to the, the two people. Now, again, in the Schedule E, it might be not exactly the same because you don't have the Social Security situation, but you have a similar kind of thing where typically they, we, wanna, we wanna allocate the income to, to the two spouses. So again, you would think, well, they're married. So of course it's joint because, because it's a joint property between the, the couple. But typically like with a Schedule C, you, you assign the property to you know, one or the other, which could have some implications in, in, terms, of, uh, in, in terms of who's being allocated 
uh, the income. So uh, if you're in community property states, then sometimes you might be able to do that fairly easily, or you might be able to use a qualified joint venture rather than having to file a separate tax return just simply because you have kind of a partnership situation for a married couple and then fi filing a separate return seems kind of like a pain to do when the only two partners are the married couple and you're trying to split it you know, like like evenly so those are your your outs on that if you're in a community property state then you might have different ability to basically kind of allocate it or split it 50 50 uh, or you might be able to use a qualified joint venture situation. So this election, uh, in most cases, won't increase the total tax owed on the joint return, but it does give each of you credit for Social Security earnings on which retirement benefits are based and for Medicare coverage if your rental income is subject to self-employment tax. So again, this is very clear on why it needs to happen with the self-employment tax, which you can usually see in a Schedule C. So if you're in a Schedule C business situation, then the, who, the people that pay into the Social Security, it's going to affect the benefits that you're going to get out of the Social Security uh, in the retirement. So, so that's going to be the idea. So if you're in community property, maybe you can split it. If you're not, then maybe you have two Schedule Cs and you, and you have this joint venture situation where you break out each of the line items between the two individuals, possibly on a 50-50 or whatever, you might have more, lim more ability to change the percentages in that cases. And if you have social security, you might try to do some tax planning to try to, to try to maximize your benefits as long as it ties into the reality of the business of the business, right? Because you might be thinking, okay, well, if I assign more of the income to one spouse or the other, what is going to be the impact on the social security? You also have to keep in the benefits you'll get at retirement. You also have to keep in mind that, that there is a cap on social security. So if your income goes over the cap and then you split the social security, the, the income between two people, you're going to end up paying more social security tax than if all the income was allocated to one individual who would then hit the cap. So it gets kind of, it gets a little bit messy. But in any case, if you make this election, you must report rental real estate income on Schedule E or Schedule C if you provide substantial uh, services. So you won't be required to file Form 1065 uh, for any year that the election is in effect. So that might help you to say, okay, we're not going to file a separate partnership return and flow it through with the K-1s when the only two partners are the the husband and wife, which are filing, in essence, a joint return, will just basically apply it out this way. So rental real estate income generally isn't included in net earnings from self-employment subject to self-employment tax is, is generally subject to the passive activity limits. So if you and your spouse filed a form 1065 for the year prior to the election, the partnership terminates at the end of the tax year immediately preceding the year the election takes place. So if you were a partnership before and you're saying, now we're going to make this election, making it easier so I don't have to file the partnership return, but just rather the two schedule E's possibly, then that would mean the partnership, which was an entity would be that was created kind of like a sole proprietorship, but with two people is now going to be terminated in essence, in theory. So, so that now that you have this situation, we don't have to file the partnership return or go through this big process of closing the partnership like you would have to do if you set it up as like a like a limited liability company or something it should be pretty easy to close just a normal partnership that just had the two the two spouses so that you can then make this election